In the words of Joe and Charlotte Costello, historians of this church in the 1980s, this is a good church. It has stood these many years, making its witness known to the community as the latter changed and grew up around Drummond beyond all expectations. Our congregation has constantly reached out to serve. Its spiritual connection to the Suncrest Flats community reflects an historical tradition of faith and Methodism stretching back 175 years to 1840, a time when Morgantown was still a part of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The earliest place of worship was a log cabin belonging to Captain James Evans, a schoolhouse for the children living on the northern side of Morgantown. Captain Evans made the facility available for Sunday worship services. The cabin was situated across the road from the present location of Suncrest United Methodist Church. Previous to this time, a few of the early settlers had formed a Methodist class, and this group was instrumental in getting a church organization set up so they could be recognized as a station by the Methodist circuit rider. At that time, there were no resident pastors in the Morgantown area. Instead, a circuit rider, attached to the Pittsburgh Methodist Episcopal Conference, served the broad area stretching from Fairmont to the Cheat River. Morgantown and five other congregations were on this circuit. The little log cabin was the only place where church services were held on the northern side of Morgantown. Therefore, this new community of faith was attracting other families who lived further out from the Suncrest area. The members of this early congregation realized that they would have to provide a larger facility to accommodate their growing numbers. Fortunately, two brothers, John and Adam Eckert, from Frostburg, Maryland, had recently moved into the community. In 1849, Adam Eckert donated a one-half acre rectangular shaped plot so that a new church building could be built there. The surviving deed reveals the names of the original trustees of our historic church. John Cornwall, William Hunt, John Mills, James Evans, David N. Zierley, George T. Evans, and Waitman T. Willie, one of the founding fathers of the state of West Virginia. The deed guaranteed that the new congregation had the right to worship unmolested according to the forms and usages of the Methodist Episcopal Church. The Methodist Episcopal Church was the oldest and largest Methodist denomination in the United States from 1784 until 1939, at which time it merged with other Methodist churches to form what eventually became the present-day United Methodist Church. The name Drummond which was selected for the new church, was chosen in order to honor a young minister who was deceased at the time, but who had been stationed in Morgantown. Thomas Drummond was born in England in 1806. His family moved to America when he was five years old. He started preaching at the age of 23 and was admitted to the Pittsburgh Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church was admitted into full connection and ordained deacon, and in 1833 he was appointed to what was then Morgantown, Virginia. After one year, he transferred to the Missouri Conference, where he died June the 15th, 1835, of cholera. Even though his time of service was short in Morgantown, he had become well known, and the people of Flats chose to honor him by naming their new church Drummond's Chapel. It wasn't until the mid-1930s that the name of the church was actually changed to Drummond Chapel. In the summer of 1850, a 30 by 24 foot wooden frame building, now known as Old Drummond Chapel, was built by James Sidwell, James Houston, and Robert Houston. The solid and sturdy pews were made from first-class poplar lumber by Joseph Weaver of Easton. The 
The dedication service was held in October 1850 under the auspices of the Reverend J. L. Clark, with a large crowd attending. The membership role of the new church came from families who lived in the vicinity. Some of the family names of these early church members were Anderson, Baker, Dean, Halderman, Jacobs, and Vandervert. Often as many as a hundred would be attending church, coming from beyond the flats. One popular oral tradition has been passed down to us by the preceding generations of our church. Some members of the congregation could not afford to buy shoes for their children, but felt it was not proper to attend services barefoot. However, when Sunday school superintendent, Captain James Evans, who was more well-to-do than most, had his own children come to church without shoes, others followed, and attendance started to increase. There seems to be little information available to indicate what was happening at Drummond for the first 70 years. We know the building was well cared for and new wallpaper and paint applied when needed. In 1875, the building was overhauled and repaired, but the overall appearance of the building was unchanged. The church's earliest original document is a Sabbath school record book that goes from June the 14th, 1891 to November the 5th, 1893. The first entry of June the 14th states that the Sabbath school was opened at 9.30 a.m. by the assistant superintendent. After singing and prayers, classes were arranged, and the lesson was the book of the law, as found in Corinthians 34, verses 14 to 28. It is recorded that the collection totaled 15 cents, and there were three officers, three teachers, and 18 scholars in attendance. M. E. Gorman was superintendent. Other members included Jacobs, Kuntz, Dean, Dilly, Vandervoort, Evans, and Trickett. The record book reflects that the Sabbath school did not meet every Sunday. On March the 19th, 1893, a resolution was recorded which stated, Whereas we, the Sabbath school of Drummond Chapel, knowing the evils of intemperance, and having learned from the Holy Scripture that the evils are from time and eternity, therefore we hereby bind ourselves never, never to drink wine or other strong drinks as beverages, so long as we live. Resolve that we condemn the manufacture and sale of all liquors in our midst and in our country for any other than medical and sacramental purposes. We also instruct our officers to read this pledge and resolution to the school for reconsideration and readoption at least once every quarter. Tucked into the center of the record book is a slip of paper stating that the Epworth League met on September the 11th, 1898. The meeting consisted of prayer, singing, and business. Dora Jacobs was elected secretary. The League chose to meet again September the 25th. In 1904, organ music became a part of the worship service. The pump organ replaced the only aid to singing to that time, a tuning fork, which the song leader had used to get the proper pitch to begin the hymns. Around 1924, a piano was secured on a trial basis, and after proving its need, was bought on time for $350. Also in 1924, a decision was made to grade and fence the lawn and build cement walks, as well as a new parsonage. A new minister was called to Drummond, but he and the congregation could not agree on plans for the parsonage, so they were scrapped and the $200 raised for it used for lawn improvements instead. Thanks to the preservation of a few church records, mostly from the late 1920s, we learned that enrollment was increasing from 65 adults in 1925-26 to 90 in 1927. In 1925, the congregation discussed ways of enlarging the building. By the end of the year, an 18-foot extension had been added to the church. The church was still one room, but the new part could be used as a classroom on Sunday morning by closing a curtain. 
In order to provide additional seating, six dozen large and two dozen small folding chairs were purchased. This was only a temporary solution for a growing church and proved a first step in a building program that would continue for more than 70 years. Sunday school had been established at Drummond Chapel with the founding of the church. But with church services being held only once a month or less frequently, the Sunday school became the dominant program at Drummond for its first 70 years. The Charles Hartley family moved on the flats in the early 1920s, and it was not long until Mr. and Mrs. Hartley became primary figures in all church and community activities. Charles Hartley served his church for nearly four decades. Whenever something needed doing, he was ready to do his part and a little bit more. Two of his many talents enhanced his influence in the church. First, he had the ability to influence others. And second, he could see ahead and plan for the future. As in 1926, when he said, Few churches have a better opportunity for development and growth than does ours. If our church is awake and makes proper use of its opportunities, it will be only a few years until we will see a new and much larger church building replace the present one and a full-time minister employed. From 1925 to 1928, the Sunday school almost doubled. Church leaders concluded that the only solution to this growing membership was to add a basement consisting of three rooms. A large room was a multi-purpose facility which could be used as a classroom or when portable tables were set up, a dining room for church suppers. One of two small rooms was used for the kindergarten classroom. The other was fitted as a kitchen. Other improvements included new flooring and a rostrum for a total cost of $2,300. Eventually, wires were fastened to the ceiling to accommodate heavy burlap curtains to partition the room into as many as six classrooms for the children's department. When Sunday school was not in session, these curtains could be drawn back and tied to the posts. As one anonymous witness noted, with only a curtain for a wall on two or three sides, Sunday school was anything but quiet. In the 1930s, in the depth of the Depression, when every Morgantown bank was forced to close, the women's Bible class bravely committed itself to supporting the minister's full salary, paying part of the church utilities, and to retiring the overdue banknote for the basement addition. The balance still owing in 1935 was $1,500. For their part, 26 men of the church agreed to meet the interest payments while the women set out in a number of fundraising endeavors, homemade ice cream socials, penny suppers, plays, and other imaginative efforts to support the church. Not until 1941 was the debt previously incurred for the basement construction fully paid. With the worst effects of the Depression over and the nation on the eve of World War II, church leaders seriously discussed how best to improve the exterior of the building itself. Suggesting that the outside was too plain and did not look like a church, some proposed adding a steeple. Others opted to extend the sides of the roof to widen the building. Without broad agreement, however, the building remained unchanged. In 1942, a narthex was added to the front of the church, and the inside was completely redecorated. Wallpaper was placed on the walls and ceiling. The floors were sanded and refinished, the woodwork painted, the pews enameled. New circulating gas heaters were installed, as was plumbing for city water. To this point, the only water for church use had been hand carried to the building. All of this work required five weeks to complete, and during the interim, services were held in the Suncrest Junior High School. B. Salisbury became a member of Drummond in 1942. She recalls attending church as a young woman. I started going to Old Drummond 73 years ago, 
and the church that I went to sits behind the big church that's there now. That little church in the back is a church that I started in. We had a full church a lot of the times, and we had adult and children's services upstairs together. But after that, the, the children went downstairs to go to their Sunday school meetings where they had other people teaching them different things that they wanted them to learn also. And that is something that I always did. And after I got there for a while, they wanted to know did I want to help take care of those kids. <laughs> and I done that also. But it was a pleasure to be working down there with people that I knew. For more than 90 years, Drummond had been part of a circuit that shared its services with two to five other churches. As church attendance had continued to grow, the idea of having a full-time minister became increasingly popular. In August 1944, a letter to church members asked whether they would be willing to increase their giving. The response was positive. As a result, in the fall of 1944, the Reverend Joseph P. DeBardi was appointed Drummond's first full-time pastor. His salary was $3,000 a year. In the words of one church member, this proved to be a very fortunate move because the new minister was young, energetic, and very capable. Another member remarked, with him at the helm, this small country church started to move. Early in 1948, members of the church were asked if they would be willing to pledge $500 over a four-year period for a new building. By the end of March, 20 had agreed. In May 1950, Good Fortune provided an opportunity to purchase an adjoining piece of land. It was a one-acre plot with a wooden frame house, which was the old Flats Elementary School building built about 1868. The cost of the property was $8,500, $6,500 of which had to be borrowed. The trustees were able to rent the building and use the proceeds to help pay off the loan. The church's growth was greatly enhanced by the unprecedented growth of West Virginia University and the resulting expansion of its campus into the Drummond neighborhood. In 1950, the university purchased 250 acres to provide land for this second campus, which would lead to the two newest university buildings, the College of Engineering and the College of Agriculture. The university then acquired the county hospital farm across the street in front of the church, and plans were also underway for the future College of Medicine and Medical Center. At the same time, the Bureau of Mines was building an experiment station in Drummond's Parish, and it was predicted that these developments would bring 50 to 75 new families into the area. The Drummond Chapel Building Committee, chaired by Charles Hartley, felt it was time to move forward with plans for a new facility. They recognized that the area was about to experience unprecedented growth and saw the opportunity to attract new church members. By the end of 1950, the firm of Griffin and Kremer of Fairmont and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was retained and drew up plans for a three-story educational building which would temporarily connect to the old frame church. Bids for the educational building were asked for and received in 1951. The lowest bid was 136000 $755. The initial campaign raised only about $32,500 in cash and pledges, so the building program had to be postponed. By the spring of 1952, loans had been arranged with 15 members of the congregation for $15,000, and $30,000 had been borrowed from the Board of Home Missions and Church Extension of the Methodist Episcopal Church. These monies were sufficient to build the ground floor of the new building and the connecting link to the proposed future sanctuary. Morgantown contractors Baker and Coombs completed this work in 1952. The Women's Society of Christian Service, or WSCS, 
planned a convenient kitchen and equipped it with a range, built-in cabinets and drawers, work counters, and sinks at a cost of $2,500. The new building was first used on February the 26th, 1953, when the WSCS sponsored a $5 per plate dinner to raise funds to pay for the cost of this newly furnished kitchen. The women served 225 dinners and raised almost half of the sum owed. The adjoining meeting dining room with a stage was closed and could be used for church and community functions, even though much more had to be done before completion, as there was no ceiling tile and the walls were not painted. During these expansions of the church building, property adjoining the north side of the church had been offered for sale. This had consisted of a house and two acres of land. One acre for parking had been bought in 1952. During these early years of the 1950s, Drummond Builders Incorporated, a nonprofit sharing corporation, had been organized to take advantage of such situations. First, it had purchased five-eighths of an acre for $3,420. Later, in 1964, it had added three-eighths of an acre with house for $3,500. Together, all purchases eventually totaled $9,920. With rental income from the house, the church paid off all interest in principal to the Drummond Builders and Citizen Savings and Loan. The property then belonged to the church. In 1954, a second floor was added to the building. The church had secured a $30,000 grant from the Kingdom Growth Program of the West Virginia Conference to cover the cost of $25,990. In 1955, Cowan Hall was converted into a temporary sanctuary at a cost of $5,000. This was necessitated by the growth in attendance at Sunday morning services in Old Drummond. Mrs. Daisy Cowan's gift of $4,000 in memory of her late husband, A. B. Cowan, helped to provide funds for this project. Palm Sunday, 1955, was the first service in which Cowan Hall was used as sanctuary. The second floor rooms were being used by a rapidly growing Sunday school. In 1956, with an additional $25,000 loan, from the Board of Home Missions and Church Extension of the Methodist Episcopal Church, increased donations from church members and some short-term financing, the final floor of the educational building was added. The total construction cost of the new building was a little over $126,000. Mr. and Mrs. Charles H. Hartley and their family and friends financed the interior finishing and furnishing of a large second floor room to be used as a chapel. The room was named Hartley Chapel in memory of their daughter, Marjorie, who had died in 1940. By this time, June of 1956, Cowan Hall was being used every Sunday morning for worship services. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Osborne generously donated a Baldwin electric organ. Thus, Drummond had now progressed from tuning fork to pump organ to upright piano, to electric organ. It was under the Reverend DeBarty's leadership that these many changes had been taking place. At the same time, Drummond Chapel's membership had grown to more than 900 by 1956, with Sunday school enrollment almost doubling to 300. With these larger numbers, two morning services at 8.30 and 10.45 were now necessary. Also in 1956, Children's Church was incorporated into the program with a large number of children attending their own services in the old sanctuary at the same two times. Old Drummond, dear to many hearts, was carefully preserved by proper maintenance and care, and it was still being used for small weddings, memorial services, and youth activities. It had been five years since the first pledges had been made to begin construction of the educational building. 
The building was still not paid for, but present plans indicated it would be in about five years. The completion of this building gave members of Drummond a feeling of accomplishment in spite of almost insurmountable obstacles. But it was still not the building they had envisioned at the start. The architect's drawing of the entire church still hung in the pastor's office. The goal now was to pay off this indebtedness after which they would finally realize their dream. In September 1959, after 15 years as pastor, Joe DeBardi became district superintendent. He had guided the church through a very exciting time. Membership had grown from fewer than 200 to more than 900, and the first phase of the new building campaign had been completed. He was well respected and his sermons well received by the congregation. Wilma Brand recalls a particular sermon the Reverend DeBardi delivered and the effect it had on the congregation. Oh, DeBardi, we love DeBardi, I will tell you. Well, he was just so friendly and he told such good stories with his sermon. We gals would wait to hear what but especially at Christmas, and when he told the story about the little little gal that was trying to get warm with the match, we he told it every year. We would take our tissue because we were going to cry. The Reverend DeBardi was a bachelor when he arrived at Drummond, but thanks to the matchmaking of the women of the church, he married member Sue Jacobs in December 1959. As a wedding gift, the women made a pink and white quilt, which they called the family quilt. It was hand-stitched, and names of church members were embroidered on it as a reminder of how binding the relationship was that the Reverend DeBardi and Sue had with members of Drummond Chapel. The Reverend Charles D. High was now appointed minister of Drummond Chapel upon DeBardi's departure. Under High's leadership, Plans for building a new sanctuary were begun. The congregation soon found they had found a good man for the job that needed to be done. Wilma Brand, Jim Benson, and architect Robert Bennett traveled to Fairmont and Clarksburg to visit other sanctuaries and returned with many ideas of what they wanted. The main floor of the new addition included a sanctuary with a seating capacity of 550 a balcony that seated 90, choir robe room, a flower communion preparation room, an office wing, library, and storage room. The lower level would consist of Sunday school rooms, nurseries, a mechanical room, a lounge, and a choir room. Both floors would connect to the education building. The plans also included the erection of a 48-foot tower plus a white steeple with a cross, ball, and fennel on top, finished in anodized gold that pointed towards heaven. Church leaders discussed the fate of Old Drummond Chapel, still in good condition. Many older members had a sentimental feeling about it. After considerable discussion, a majority decided to move it to its present location. As I think back of the campaign that we underwent to raise the money to move ahead with the sanctuary, the thing that stands out in my mind was the sharp division within the congregation between modifying the old white chapel and building a new sanctuary. And at a one point, we were almost at a total impasse, and we came up with the idea of relocating the old chapter, chapel and building a completely new building, and that brought the group together, and we proceeded from there. The first fundraiser for the new addition was held October 23, 1961. At this forward step banquet, 
$76,000 was raised in cash and pledges. By the end of the week, members had exceeded their goal of $100,000, approximately one-third the estimated cost needed to qualify for a bank loan. The committee continued to raise money during the next two years. Following another successful banquet, long-term financing was arranged with the First National Bank. On Sunday, April 12, 1964, the official groundbreaking ceremony took place. They were just deciding and starting to raise money for this uh, addition that we're in right now. And the uh, old Roman was sitting here where we're sitting now on this spot. We think it was around $320,000 that we were raising. And we'd raised most of it the time we started to uh, do the building in uh, spring of 1964. And uh, the uh, Liston Construction Company took the bid for the construction and started the building. Uh, the building went along pretty well until Liston went bankrupt and the bonding company had to finish it up. And I think that Baker and Coombs was finished it up. The cornerstone slid into place on Sunday, October 22nd. The first church service in the new sanctuary was held on Palm Sunday, April the 11th, 1965. It had been 10 years since the first church service had been held in Cowan Hall, which was part of the first phase of the building of the new sanctuary. The service of consecration of the new sanctuary was held October 17, 1965. From 1962 to 1964, the Reverend Lloyd Myers became a part-time associate pastor. In June 1965, the Reverend Fred Villinger was appointed the first full-time associate pastor. Each served for two years. A third building campaign was conducted in 1966. Enough money was raised to air condition the sanctuary and the classrooms on the lower level. The departure of the Reverend Charles High occurred in 1968. Parishioners would remember him for his inspired and wise counsel, especially during the long campaign to build a new sanctuary. High's successor was the Reverend Harper Callison. He arrived just when his new congregation was preparing for its fourth consecutive building fund drive. Despite hopes that there would be enough money to provide a down payment on a parsonage, this goal was not reached. Committee members understood that the recurring fundraising efforts were beginning to wear on the enthusiasm of many churchgoers. In spite of this setback, enough members felt that a parsonage was needed to establish a special fund to purchase a house at 415 Lawnview Drive. The cost, $35,356.32. This was a clear departure from the day in 1944 when the Reverend Joe DeBarty had come to Drummond Chapel. From the time of his tenure until 1969, the church had simply rented furnished rooms or a house for the pastor and his or her family. After he arrived, the Reverend Callison helped organize a motion choir, a group using dance in worship. It included preschoolers, junior high age students, and a few adults. The group did many special dances, including a call to worship in which all movements were directed toward the altar. The Reverend Callison said, it's, it's like using drama in understanding the Bible. We all use movement in worship, such as kneeling, but dance uses more creative movement. In 1969, Drummond Chapel entered into a lease agreement with the Monongahela County Schools for the church to provide Sunday school rooms for a kindergarten. The Drummond Chapel Day Kindergarten began holding classes September the 2nd. The cost per student was $10 for registration and $25 a month for tuition. The lease was terminated February the 1st, 1980 when the county school system moved the kindergarten to the newly built North Elementary School. On Sunday, November the 1st, 1970, a new organ, purchased from funds received from the Hall Rowan Estate, was dedicated to the memory of Mrs. Cordelia Hall, 
Mr. and Mrs. Richard Rowan, and Miss Mary Louise Hall. The Rogers electronic organ cost $12,000. A special concert was held at 4 o'clock that day in dedication. In the early 70s, the church benefited from the Daisy Cowan estate and used the gift to retire the parsonage debt and the remainder of the construction loan from the Monongahela Building and Loan Association. In 1973, the annual conference announced that there would again be a change in ministers. The Reverend Paul H. Smith would come to Drummond from Charleston. At the same time, the Reverend Martha Lloyd and the Reverend E. Grant Nine were appointed associate pastors. Several changes were made to the appearance of the church during the early 70s. The old wooden sign, which had been swinging in the wind for 12 years, was replaced with a modern aluminum one, purchased with memorial funds. Sidewalks were also added. Aluminum siding with wood-like appearance was also installed on the exterior of Old Drummond. Under the Reverend Smith, Drummond Chapel experienced further growth. Two other important events in the history of this church occurred during Smith's tenure the placing of a large cross above the altar in the chancel, and the creation of a handbell choir. For more than eight years, from April 1965 to December 1973, a small bronze cross had graced the original altar, which sat against the back wall of the chancel area. The cross, however, was not easily seen by the congregation, especially those sitting at the back of the sanctuary. When Smith became pastor in July 1973, he decided that the church needed a much larger cross, one mounted on the wall above the altar. He approached his good friend, Etley P. Jenkins, to make the cross. Jenkins, a professor of wood sciences in the WVU Division of Forestry, agreed, hand-hewing the cross and staining it with a mix of stains. The date was burned in the back of the cross with a branding iron, and Jenkins delivered the 16-foot-tall cross to Suncrest in the back of a truck. Under the direction of Mrs. Mary Morrison, the handbells have provided musical inspiration for the congregation as well as the surrounding community. Through the years, the adult, teen, and children's handbell choirs have performed in worship services, in concerts, at prisons, and in nursing homes. By 1978, Reverend Smith could report that church attendance was continuing to increase and that nearly 50% of the church's membership was attending Sunday services every week. The annual conference journal reported that there were only eight churches in the state with weekly averages higher than Suncrest. The elementary church school program was growing steadily as was the evening youth program by several hundred percent. Because of his love of education, Smith initiated the first Sunday school classes for college students. From 1979 through 1980, Drummond Chapel continued to participate in college educational activities. The Reverend Reba Thurmond, a pioneer in church ministry at West Virginia University, wrote to the Charge Conference that she found it a particular joy to worship with the congregation of Drummond Chapel Church, and that she appreciated the support given by this church and its pastors for ministry to WVU students. The expansion of WVU's facilities into the Suncrest Evansdale area continued at this time, and on September the 6th, 1980, the new football stadium was opened. With it came a fundraising activity, a new one, one that continues to this day, football parking on church property. The proceeds help pay for the maintenance and upkeep of the church's parking lot and support youth mission trips. The first year, the United Methodist women even sold hot dogs and drinks to fans. In April 1981, Drummond Chapel retired its indebtedness and the building was dedicated on Sunday, May the 24th. All former ministers living attended the note-burning service. These included the Reverends DeBarty, High, Villinger, Callison, Lloyd, Smith, 
and 9. The Reverend Dan Johnson came to Drummond in 1982 with his wife Becky and their children. Prior to his first sermon, he had the dark velvet curtains removed from the windows in the sanctuary so that the area was filled with more light and the stained glass panels in the windows shone brightly. The Reverend Johnson and his wife were also instrumental in decorating Hartley Chapel as it remains today. The Reverend Johnson's ministry was enhanced by his ability to include members of his congregation in ministry and outreach. Among the activities and special services that he sponsored were Advent concerts in Old Drummond, talent shows, Shrove Tuesday pancake dinners, and annual Cooper's Rock services. The services at Cooper's Rock, held the first Sunday in September, are still very popular. Worshippers bring covered dish breakfast foods to share before the service begins. The service, held in a clearing or shelter, includes sermon, music, and communion. Until the Reverend Johnson came, Children's Church was held the entire Sunday worship service. He wrote to parents stating, all children aged five and over will be in worship with their parents. Children are a very special part of the fellowship and should be in worship with the congregation. Only after the offering was received did the children have the option of staying in the sanctuary, attending choir, or continuing worship in Old Drummond. In 1984, new paraments were in use. Sets of altar, lectern, and pulpit hangings were sewn by Ruth Weibel and given by the Andy family, Helen and Harold Osborne, Betty Vorbach and Wren Wolf, John and Liz Miller, and Clark and Allison McKee. In July 1986, the Drummond Chapel trustees paid $125,000 for three parcels and improvements, which became known as the Windsor Parsonage. This property was rented for some years until occupied by Associate Pastor Steve Meadows. The property was paid off when Pastor Meadows moved into the house. During the Reverend Johnson's tenure at Drummond Chapel, the Reverend Kenneth E. Noland, between 1984 and 86, and the Reverend Susan McGee, from 1986 to 1989, served as associate pastors. On Sunday, October the 18th, 1987, the Sunday school children buried a time capsule on the front right south facing Old Drummond. It is plastic PVC pipe with ends glued on. Although the capsule was to be removed 20 years later, it is still buried today. In 1989, the Reverend Ronald M. McCauley and his wife Peg came to Drummond Chapel. A member of the congregation described him as a visionary who wanted to grow the church and the conference. Several new programs began under his leadership. A new staff position, Parish Nurse, was created, the first program of its kind in West Virginia. Cindy Drenning, a registered nurse, volunteered her services for the first year. In 1993, the position expanded. Now 20 hours per week, funding for the position was from the church's budget. In an interview, Cindy Drenning commented, the development of the parish nurse role under the Reverend Macaulay was new and risk-taking, as people were not familiar with it. Today, the parish health nurse and the health team address many health needs with the congregation and community, including home and hospital visits to promote health and connecting members with needed community resources. Additionally, Parish nurse and team have provided various programs for the congregation, such as blood pressure screenings, health alerts, flu shot clinics, blood donation drives, health Sabbath services, and resources for community health program development. The church continues to be a leader in the parish health ministry program, one of the very few congregations with such services. Soon after the Reverend Macaulay arrived, the church initiated a new ministry, recording the Sunday morning services on cassette tapes for the homebound. A senior fitness exercise program 
also began. Under the leadership of Val Markle, Director of Christian Education, the youth program experienced a period of steady growth. Activities such as youth trips and work camps were given special attention. The decision was made to purchase the first van used to transport the youth and their chaperones. The Suncrest Quilters began as the Drummond Quilters in the early 1990s when Mary Weimer moved to Morgantown and attended Drummond Chapel. Pastor Ron McCauley visited with her and she quickly told him how much it had meant to her being a member of a quilting group at her home church in Pennsylvania. Soon after, Pastor McCauley's wife, Peg, became instrumental in organizing a group of quilters at Drummond Chapel United Methodist Church. The founding members of the group were Lucille Albright, Wava Clark, Susan Glover, Libby Harden, Diana Krinke, Lois Lillard, Peg McCauley, Margaret Shuloff, and Mary Weimer. Later, Wilma Brand, Robin Wren, Stella Cook, Sue Wilson, Bonnie Tennell, Ruth Marstiller, and Ruth Long joined the group. In the beginning, the women donated fabric and supplies, and Libby Harden provided the group with quilting frames. Members of the church and others donated monies for supplies. The women chose to meet Tuesday evenings for two hours in a Sunday school room in the lower level of the church. Sometimes the group would meet at Libby's house and at the parsonage. Later, the group began meeting during the day in the quilter's room on the third floor. Once the design for the first quilt was chosen, each person made a square. It was a challenge to piece together the squares because each was a different size. But the women met the challenge and made a beautiful quilt. The quilt tops were made two ways, some by the entire group and others by an individual. In either event, the group would then quilt the finished top. As the quilts were made, they were displayed in the narthex and sold by silent auction. Longtime church members Bob and Beverly Hayden bought the first quilt. Then the women chose another pattern to piece together, and so began the Drummond Quilters. Stella Cook made the quilt top for the quilt purchased by Dr. Ron and Janie Hill. The group made a quilt or quilts to auction every year. Although not a part of the United Methodist Women, the quilters did display at the yearly UMW Bazaar, where they donated such items for sale as pillows, table runners, and other hand-stitched crafts. The monies from the sales were placed in the quilter's fund to purchase needed quilting supplies. Besides quilts, the group made a few lap robes used as prayer quilts for persons in the congregation who were ill. They also quilted blue Christmas paraments and made various wall hangings which hung on the right and left side front of the sanctuary. The group enjoyed working together and often lunch together. Their average age was roughly 75 years. One member indeed was in her 90s. When Drummond Chapel merged with Trinity and Star City United Methodist Churches and became the Suncrest Extended Cooperative Ministries in 1994, the group changed its name to Suncrest Quilters. While they were working, Peg McCauley purchased a copy of the book Watercolor Quilts, which was filled with pictures of various quilts. One that caught the attention of the quilters was the United Methodist logo of the cross and flame. Inspired, the quilters counted the two by two squares in the picture and calculated the quilt size. With the help and expertise of member Susan Glover, the group made the quilt. Peg McCauley was a caregiver for Pastor Ron's parents, so the group met at the parsonage while piecing this quilt. They would stand on the stairs and squint to get an elevated perspective so they could see any mistakes in the color blocks. The rows of squares were numbers, and Diana Krinke finished stitching the quilt top at home before returning it to the group to quilt. When finished, Frank Ammons made a quilt rack to display it and it hung in the church for a long time. 
The quilt was also shared on other occasions. It was on display during the annual conference at West Virginia Wesleyan College. It also won second prize in the quilt contest at the West Virginia State Fair in 2002. And it was used as a backdrop for worship services during Suncrest's sanctuary renovation in 2006. Soon after the addition to the church in 1998, the quilters traveled to Sugar Creek, Ohio to purchase two benches and a table for the new narthex using monies received from the sale of the quilts. At a later date, a table was purchased for the Perry's health area where blood pressures were taken on Sunday morning. The Macaulays retired in 2002 and the group continued to meet for a while and made trips to Buchanan, West Virginia to visit with the Macaulays. The Suncrest quilters enjoyed the fellowship they shared and felt it enhanced their love of Christ and the church and each other. In 2013, Stella Cook made the last quilt top that the group completed. Dennis and Donna Chancel purchased the quilt. The quilters then disbanded. Three times in the past 25 years, Val and Mark Markle directed and produced The Christmas Story. The setting for the first production in the early 1990s was Ira Baker's farm on Baker's Ridge Road, with the children playing the parts of Mary, Joseph, the angels, shepherds, wise men, and innkeepers. The children donned costumes, angels perched on the beams of the barn, a slideshow was made for the service, which was shown on Christmas Eve. The second production, around 2001, was staged at the Boy Scout camp, where the actors in costume and the film crew climbed to a rocky ledge, there to film angels, shepherds, kings, and the Holy Family. A cave located close by became the stable. That year, the program was in PowerPoint. A return trip to the Boy Scout camp in 2013 set the stage for a third production. Everyone had fun, finding places for the children to recreate the wondrous story of Jesus' birth. That year, music from the internet, recorded narrative by the children, and accompanying pictures were brought together in an iMovie. In 1991, Reverend Macaulay appointed Martha Spiro as the first director of college ministry. She served in that capacity for two years and was succeeded by Elizabeth Butch Baker, who led the program until 1999. It was fitting that Butch Baker's motto for the college program was, a home away from home. College students met every Thursday evening to enjoy fellowship enriched by Bible study. They met at the college house, which was the former Flats Elementary School. In late summer 1991, Val Markle organized Hands Around the Church, with children participating in a kickoff for the start of the fall Sunday School. Three associate pastors served the church for various periods of time during these years. The Reverend William Kinsey from 1990 to 2010, the Reverend Linda Glass from 1995 to 1997, and the Reverend Michael Stephen Meadows from 1997 to 2005. In early 1994, Drummond joined together with Trinity United Methodist Church on Borough Street and Star City United Methodist Church on University Avenue to form the Suncrest Extended Cooperative Ministries. This union provided all three churches with a full ministry package, including a pastor for Sunday services, a musician on piano or organ, and either a choir or an individual musical performance. Pastors Macaulay, Kinsey, and Meadows rotated each Sunday so that services at Drummond, Star City, and Trinity could be held every week. The pastors, in collaboration with representatives from the three churches, fulfilled the programming and planning needs for all three. At the same time, a long-range planning committee reported in November 1994 on plans for future development. In consideration of these plans, the congregation delineated a number of projects as priority needs. 
On February the 12th, 1995, the proposed first project of the master plan was adopted with excitement. The proposed first project includes the following. One, the construction of a new two-story addition. The first floor will contain administrative offices, including staff offices, library conference room, counseling meeting room, and a large workroom. Classrooms with a variety of uses and potential will be located on the lower level. Two, an elevator will be installed to make all three floors handicapped accessible along with enhancements to the entrance to the present narthex. Three, a new recreation building will be used for a variety of indoor sports and exercise and fellowship activities. Four, the music department will be moved into the former administrative area. Five, additional parking will be provided. Six, repairs will be made to the east wall. We have a real need for classrooms. We have no space to grow new adult classes or special study interest groups. We have adult classes meeting in cramped rooms. One adult class meets in Cowan Hall behind portable screens. The children recently had to have a series of opening exercises before Sunday school in the sanctuary. We have had classes from time to time meeting in the conference room at Hampton Inn. We have a youth class meeting on the third floor where other classes walk through in order to get to their own class. With a growing Sunday school and expanding ministry for children and youth, space is at a premium. Our early dismissal program oftentimes needs to be outside because the larger spaces are already in use. We need the space of the recreational building so that the entire church can gather for recreation and fellowship. The goal of the original campaign was just over $2 million. Over 200 participants pledged just under $600,000. The shortfall forced difficult decisions. The question became to what degree could the scope of work be reduced without jeopardizing the congregation approved original proposal. In the face of these difficulties, the committee sought a financial package, including a construction loan and a 15 year mortgage covering the costs not met by the forward through the ages gifts and pledges. Unfortunately, there were no funds available to build the activities building and this project was put on hold. This was a time of intensive communication within the congregation. Newsletters, brochures, posters, suggested Bible readings, and a series of special sermons all concerned the church's future. Members met within neighborhood sport groups to view a special video presentation and hear Pastor McCauley offer his ideas. Commercial Builders, Inc. of Morgantown was the lowest bidder for completing the work on Drummond Chapel. Between May of 1997 and June 1998, the work proceeded. One of the interesting things to me uh, is, was the construction of this building, that it, we're sitting on a uh, lake bed out here, and this big wall behind the uh, pulpit here on the outside is a freestanding wall. And when they backfilled it, they backfilled it with wet clay. And we didn't know this, so I'll follow through on it a little bit. But anyway, that clay bonded to the wall. And when it would dry out, it would pull the wall away from the building. And when it would get wet, it would push it back. And it took over 30 years for us to figure out what the problem was. Uh, when we were getting ready to put the uh, new addition with Forward Through the Ages on, uh, the architect brought a con a, uh, engineer down and he went upstairs and looked all around and uh, saw the cracks where it was leaving the building. And he, we went out and dug a hole down beside the building. He says, there's the problem. He said, they backfilled that wet clay 
and it bonded. Whenever it gets wet in the fall, it pushes it back. And when it dries out in the summer, it pulls it out. And so uh, we were lucky. It was in against the building in June when we started to, to dig that out. That was the first project on our Forward Through the Ages here. And we fixed it, and it's never moved since. It's been over 20 years since we uh, did that. Initially, excavation and foundation work for the two-story addition went smoothly until a truck strike delayed the delivery of construction steel. Each day of delay translated into increased costs for other materials and deliveries. Together, these difficulties delayed construction for roughly three months. This meant that a number of features had to be trimmed to stay within budgetary constraints. In the face of these delays and changes, the Building Steering Committee hired Jim Clevenger to represent the church in working with architect and contractor to smooth out these many problems. We had a few problems, nothing major, but we did have a few problems uh, during construction. And uh, one was after about six months into the uh, contract, we had a change in foreman. We had a new foreman come, come on board, and he was really not familiar with the, uh, with the plans or familiar with the work. And uh, to be honest, he didn't show up much. He probably wasn't on the job more than 25% of the time. And that really tended to, to slow us down quite a bit. Uh, the main floor, the main floor upstairs, that's the one up uh, on the main level. Right after we poured the concrete, it came a thunderstorm, a pretty severe thunderstorm, and it got wet, and it damaged the concrete. And I remember, uh, you know, we, we went around and around about that, how to repair that and make sure that it was acceptable. But we finally, we finally got that worked out. The outside wall, the outside wall was kind of a complicated design, a little difficult to build, and it was during the grouting process for the wall that we had a lot of trouble getting grout into the, into the wall. We did have some problems with the paint. We had a contractor to begin with that really, really wasn't doing a very good job, so he had to be replaced. But after we got that, uh, things went a lot, a lot better. Now, there was uh, the weather. We had weather delays, so that uh, tended to delay the uh, completion date for the, uh, for the building. We had a couple minor accidents. One was uh, one, of the, one of the workers got something in his eye, so he had to go to the hospital, but that turned out all right. And then later, a little later on, why, uh, two of the workers got pinned in between two pieces of machinery. Now that was, it was really fortunate that they didn't get hurt worse than what they did, but they ended up with uh, some bruises and, uh, you know, and they were, they were all right. So we were, we were real, real fortunate in, uh, from the standpoint of safety and uh, no major accidents. There is a time capsule and it was prepared and it is in the uh, wall near the uh, main entrance, near the front entrance. It's behind the forge through the ages plaque and it is to be opened in 50 years. May the 3rd, 1998 was Consecration Sunday. Now the Building Steering Committee shifted its focus to a new effort, the Forward Through the Ages 2 campaign. It began the second week of May 1998 and ended seven weeks later. Pledges totaling $433,463 were to be paid over a three-year period from July 1998 to June 2001. The total cost for this project was a million two hundred thousand dollars. With the debt paid in full and several years ahead of schedule, a mortgage note burning was part of the worship service on June the 3rd, 2001. Many sacrificed and gave to make this much needed addition to the church property a reality. Anyone who talks about the building addition speaks with great pride and satisfaction about the work done in the church over the years. A special recognition goes to those who gave so willingly, as indicated by the plaques placed on various space entities. 
the workroom space given by William and Susan Brewer and children, the conference room given in honor of Pastor Ron McCauley, the senior pastor's office, a gift from Lillian W. McCafferty, the associate pastor's office given by Herbert and Audrey Warden, and the Kelsey Wilkins Library. Brenda Wilkins, Kelsey's mother, recalls how the church family supported Kelsey and her cause. Kelsey died in, uh, uh, it was March 23rd of 1996 from leukemia. Kelsey had talked and talked to us, her, both, both parents, John and I, and she said, I really think that the library would benefit greatly. Uh, the children, uh, the kids, at the uh, uh, college ministry because Kelsey went to WVU and she knew what was going on there with the church and how they were reaching out to the college students and she said if we could put a library in the church I think that it would be so helpful not only to the students but to anyone that um, could come there maybe just to have a few quiet moments, maybe to read, maybe to pray, there in the library. And Kelsey said to us, please, please ask people in lieu of flowers to donate to the church or the library. I just think that um, the support that we had was tremendous because of the true love that we felt all the time that Kelsey was fighting this battle for her life and uh, she was not alone. It's apparent that vision, pride, and sacrifice have moved us forward as a people. Further enhancements to worship came with the purchase of a new organ costing $80,000 and a baby grand piano. In addition, a row of 34 kneeling pads, stitched by a dedicated group of needleworkers, which included Pastor McCauley and his wife Peg, would henceforth line the railing of the chancel. At the same time, Pastor Kinsey noticed that when sitting in the congregation, the stained glass windows looked all too plain, believing that they would be enhanced by symbols above and below each sash he designed and installed these additions to the windows. In December 1997, the Drummond Chapel trustees purchased the Sandy property and improvements from Dwight Pauley for $110,000. The trustees used the house as rental income for several years, and in 2006, a decision was made to have it torn down because it had fallen into disrepair. See, we hadn't purchased the property yet back where the uh, pavilion is until, uh, in fact, the, I was chair of the trustees and we were paying off the parsonage over there. And then I was chair of the trustees and we bought the other piece of property down by Friendship Manor there. It had a two-story house on it and we were renting it. And it got to be a bad shape, so we just quit renting it and tore it down. Uh, this was another interesting story. Uh, Mrs. Daisy Cowan died, and she left the church some property, and she left the uh, trustees some stock, and I think it amounted to about $60,000 at that time. Oh, and I left the trustees, and I can't remember what year it was, but it was uh, late 80s. That stock had appreciated to $444,000. In fact, uh, f when we bought that piece, last piece of property for $120,000, we agreed to buy it on the 1st of November and we closed in December, and that stock appreciated $40,000 uh, on that month. And uh, so actually we only paid out of pocket $80,000 uh, for that property over there. But uh, she had a house, and I forget what else she left, but we sold the house and paid off some of the bills for the church we're owing. 
But uh, part of the problem ended up, uh, that's when the stock market fell, that stock got down to about 200,000. And the new trustees that took over uh, decided they needed to spend that money, so they spent it all. Most of it went on the heating and cooling system uh, downstairs. But uh, that $444,000 was making us $15,000 a month, or a year, I mean, for the trustees. That was our budget, was off of that uh, estate. <laughs> but that was AT&T stock, is what it was. And uh, several of the ministers wanted to sell it and pay off little bills, and Earl, uh, Bob Corr was treasurer, and he wouldn't let him do it. He, he knew finances. and. Uh, Bob was the one who really took care of our finances and got us out of the hole here. Expansion next came in the form of consolidating the three churches, Trinity, Star City, and Drummond, which officially merged in 1999. Occurring under the auspices of a church conference, the new merger was named the Suncrest United Methodist Church. Some of the things that often go through my mind as I reflect back uh, on those years, the bag lady, the pew potato sermon, baptism of infants, the lullaby. In 2002, a new pastor, the Reverend Oslem Barquette, and his wife Esther arrived at Suncrest. In the same year, Kids Rock was launched under the direction of music director Jana Kisner and the Reverend Meadows. This after-school program included transportation, furnished by volunteers, snack time, children's choir, with the accompanist being Betty Alexander, crafts, and handbells taught by Mary Morrison. The popular kids' rock remains active to the present day and occasionally contributes music to Sunday services. The Reverend Adam Justice was appointed to Suncrest United Methodist Church in 2002. On becoming the college ministry leader, he observed that he had never witnessed a congregation doing so much for college students as did Suncrest. College House, now located in Old Drummond, was equipped with a washer dryer, Wi-Fi, and a lounge study area for student use. And church members prepared an evening meal for the students every Sunday. A major accomplishment in 2003 was the completion of a new driveway, traffic signal, and landscaping near the east end of the church building. The driveway and traffic signal cost $78,055 paid for from the major improvement fund. Most of the landscaping funds were provided by church members in memory of or in honor of family and friends. Another project completed in 2003 was the renovation of Cowan Hall. Stage area carpet, a new ceiling, and floor tiles were installed, and the walls were painted. These improvements were made possible by the generous donation of Mrs. Thelma Andy. In 2004, the trustees contracted for the demolition of the former college house, then in disrepair. As the church continued to grow, Pastor Barquette created a leadership forum that met every Saturday for six weeks. From it came recommendations that included a witness minute and congregational participation in worship services. Additionally, Reverend Marcy Taylor was hired as the Christian Education Director. Under her tutelage came children's Sunday school and middle and high school youth groups. At her initiative, Children's Church for Preschoolers through second grade, held during the main part of the worship service, began. 
a successful activity which continues today. Taylor also oversaw the Disciple One class with 11 people attending. Bill and Harriet Van Voris continue to lead the Bible study groups today. Discussions between the Building Steering Committee and the congregation resulted in numerous changes between February and August of 2006. Now, one of the things that happened in this church was the renovation of the sanctuary. Several individuals of the church in leadership roles realized how important it was to renovate the sanctuary, including handicap accessibility, because there was no handicap accessibility, which limited who could participate in services, who could come up and participate in special activities, plus the fact the sanctuary was so limited you couldn't do other types of performances. For example, today you could never have had a contemporary service as we do under the old sanctuary. Lindell Malekia deserves much of the credit for leading that cause along with several members uh, of her committee. Aided by discussions and frequent meetings between the committee and architect Steve Kupchak, these renovations included a handicapped accessible ramp to the chancel area, the addition of a sacristy preparation area to the right of the chancel, refurbishment of the pews, installation of a new carpet, construction of a media center at the rear of the sanctuary, installation of a new sound and projection system and spotlights controlled from the media center, addition of movable risers for the choir. The building steering committee met with the architect and his interior designer for advice on fabric, carpeting, and overall color schemes. Initially, the architect advised hardwood floors under the pews. That would create better acoustics for congregational singing. That, however, proved too expensive for the budget. The overall color scheme was changed from blue walls and white beams to tan walls and brown beams. This proved to be the most controversial part of the renovation. However, the painting proceeded. A plastic drape separated the chancel area from the sitting area for Sunday worship services. At first, a metal frame held a tapestry and later the cross and flame quilt. Music director Jana Kisner was instrumental in acquiring the Common Threads tapestry from a Presbyterian church in Michigan. The fabrics forming the cross were from many sources, chosen for color, and is representative of the many cultures who worshiped in that church. The Suncrest quilters made the cross and flame quilt, which they gave to the church. It represented a watercolor of many colors. Later, during the summer when the pews were temporarily removed, services were held in Cowan Hall. In 2008, the Star City Church property was sold for $94,000 to Morgantown's Meals on Wheels, with $85,000 of the proceeds dedicated to the renovations. The Trinity Church property was also sold for $850,000, with the proceeds dedicated to the building of a Trinity Family Life Center. The buyer pledged an additional $100,000 in charitable contributions over eight years. The church also sold the Lawnview House, netting $202,266. It had been used as a parsonage for 50 years. Monies from the Trinity Family Life Center Fund helped to pay off the sanctuary renovation mortgaged. In 2008, the Reverend Timothy Halloran became the head pastor. He and his wife Reba and their two children were the first to occupy a new parsonage in White Oaks one purchased by the church for $450,000. The parsonage was paid for with the proceeds from the sale of the Longview Parsonage and monies from the Trinity Family Life Center Fund. As a result of the excellent rapport between Reverend Halloran and Pastor Bill Kinsey, the latter was called out of retirement in October to serve as pastor on call. In 2010, 
Kinsey retired again. Under the direction of Robin Wren, a prayer quilt ministry began in 2009. This ministry is one of the largest at Suncrest. Currently, 46 members prepare quilts as they have from the beginning, an awesome endeavor which draws people together in prayer. A very good friend of mine was in a car accident. They didn't think she was going to survive. And talking with her mother, her mother told me that her church brought a prayer quilt to Terry, my friend, and put it over her. And her mother swears to this day that Terry's recovery started that moment. Terry does too. Terry's fine. So that got me thinking about the prayer quilt ministry and I investigated it a little bit more and then I talked to some of the women when we did apple butter. In March of 2009 we did our very first prayer quilt for Bill Brown. Unfortunately Bill had already passed by the time we did the prayer quilt but his wife Char has it and she sleeps with it to this day. I started like I said, in March of 2009, and when I handed over the leadership in March of 2014, we had done close to 700 quilts, prayer quilts. We've done an untold number of prayer squares, and it's an awesome thing to have these prayer quilts and to know that they've brought people together with prayers. We've given quilts to newborn babies that have come into the world too early. We've given prayer quilts to people that are lived their whole life and are on their way out. Some of, some of those recipients have breathed their last breath under a prayer quilt. And that's the hardest for me, to know that the prayer quilt didn't bring them healing. But in talking with other people, it did bring them a type of healing because they've gone on to the balcony, which in a way is a healing. I love the prayer quilt ministry. It's the one thing in my life that God called me to do. Prayer quilts have become constants in people's lives as they face times of crises. Whether they have a bad day or a better day, they find that their quilt provides a continuing reminder that prayers have been offered, knots have been tied, and God continues to listen. The Reverend Junius Lewis arrived in 2010 as a part-time associate pastor. He became full-time pastor in 2012, filling the need of a growing church for two full-time pastors. In 2011 and 2012, Angela Smith named Director of Music in 2010, and Mark Markle collaborated in the production of A Living Last Supper. Men attired in period costumes portrayed Jesus and the Twelve Disciples in a musical narrative production on Maundy Thursday, the anniversary of the Lord's Supper. This proved a special part of Easter week services in these two years. Music has always played a special role in the church of Charles and John Wesley, and worship services at Suncrest have been no exception. Under the direction of Smith, the present day music could best be described as energized, passionate, and eclectic. A contemporary worship service led by the praise band was added in 2011, and on any given Sunday, the congregation might hear and sing various types of music including classical works, hymns, spirituals, Southern gospel, African-American gospel, country, pop, and modern folk. A number of special evening programs were begun under Smith's leadership, including old-timey music, Motown, Broadway, and gospel. The Zimbelstern, sitting on top of the organ in the sanctuary, was given by Pastor Bill Kinsey, to the glory of God and in honor of his wife Donna for serving God through music. The Zimbelstern has small bells attached to a star-shaped disc which chimes when the organist activates the bar. The present chancel choir is comprised of 35 singers 
many with long-standing roots at Suncrest, others new to the church. WVU students comprised a special component of the choir, with some participants in a music internship program, which provides music majors with special opportunities. Children of different ages also provide vocal and instrumental renditions at various worship services throughout the year. I've been singing in choirs for over 60 years, and the bulk of that time has been, however, with Suncrest United Methodist Church. We've had um, a large choir in recent years because we have much more seating for the choir now. The choir faces toward the congregation instead of toward each other, which was the original configuration. And uh, I'm not sure how well they heard us in those days. We not only face outward, but then we are picked up by microphones and the sound goes through speakers around the sanctuary as well and, of course, is recorded. The, the comradeship in the choir is quite nice. We have several people such as myself that have been there for many, many years. We have, on the other end of the spectrum, we have very young students, uh, some of whom are interns with us, and they're a lot of fun to have around, and uh, they kind of spice us up a little bit, you might say. And the, uh, the music is greatly enhanced with their presence. Uh, it gives us the depth and the capability that we might not have otherwise because they are in training and they can bring some of their uh, learning to the choir and uh, help us out in that regard. As you get older, sometimes your voice is not as good as it once was. And um, I have known some people that were in the choir for years and, and gave it up because their, their voice uh, was failing them. And uh, that's really too bad. But on the other hand, new people come along and uh, embellish the choir in a very, very nice manner. And uh, the director, now Angela Smith, works in coordination with the pastors to select music that's appropriate to either the scripture or the sermon whenever possible. And uh, so we deliver musically related text to enhance the uh, sermon and the overall service. We have uh, many very loyal choir people. Um, for instance, the Bierces, and we came within a year of each other and we are all still in the music program some way or another. Uh, Brad and Sonia sing and I sing in the choir. Uh, Johnny Gilmore is another example, many, many years in the choir. People mainly that are no longer in the choir have moved away. In the uh, category of uh, guest musicians, you might say, or uh, musicians with instruments uh, supplementing and playing with the choir, uh, sometimes we do not need to at least rehearse the entire uh, music with them uh, because they're so good. And they, they are professionals and they can pick up very quickly. We do sometimes uh, have them there for that portion of a rehearsal. Uh, and they once we're, we have to get ready for them more than them getting ready for us because they're that good. But, you know, one of, the, one of my thrills in life is just to be sitting within a choir and making the sound. That's just an experience that everybody should have. <laughs> From early in the church's history, children's programs have been a main feature. Children's ministry director Yvonne Lee has said, Suncrest United Methodist Church is a church that loves kids. We are constantly striving to change and improve our programming in ways that will connect our kids to God.
Programs include Vacation Bible School, holiday and seasonal activities, and acolyte participation in Sunday worship services. The Kids Rock program remains very popular. BLAST, that stands for Bible Learning and Sharing Together, is held during Children's Church when children worship kid style. January 2010 marked the beginning of an expanded number of ministry teams at Suncrest. Besides the prayer quilt ministry, other key ministry teams include missions, technology, grounds and facilities, peace with justice, respite rock, compassion visitation, and education. Pastor Ron McCauley led efforts to bring audio technology to the sanctuary, along with the ability to broadcast services on the radio through a partnership with Morgantown radio station WAJR. Audio technology made a major leap forward during the sanctuary remodeling of 2006. This upgrade included the addition of video projection capabilities and construction of a control center platform and console. Our new audiovisual system was scheduled to debut on Easter Sunday, 2006, but a lightning strike on Good Friday damaged the soundboard and new video equipment. The technology team, through Herculean efforts, reverted to old audio equipment and the old system for Easter, but the introduction of video was delayed until insurance claims were resolved and replacement equipment procured. In 2009, a video television ministry provided Sunday services on Morgantown's Comcast cable. The service was first aired on October the 12th with Chuck Bickenick recording the service using a single tripod-mounted camera. I was approached by nurse Kathy Resig and Pastor Tim about the possibility of uh, getting a contract with Comcast. Uh, for a broadcast on cable channel three. And the uh, availability was there. We had no equipment. Our funds were very, not very limited. There was a, a very small budget. And immediately I could see the budget would not work with what we needed to do. So one camera was purchased by Tim. The camera was placed in the back of the sanctuary. I was up on a platform with a tripod, a single camera, and it looked more like a home video than an actual te television production. It was quite apparent that we had to, at some point, switch over to multiple cameras and be in a remote area because the, where I was located it was not convenient at all because uh, communications between tech members of the crew had to be done in such a way that uh, it would become uh, disruptive to the service itself. So uh, exploration was done in the church and we moved from the sanctuary area to an upstairs area right above the, the current soundboard in uh, what was referred to, some people called an echo room, but it was just to the right of the echo room. It was a, just a storage area for old records and. And that thing. The recorded service was converted to a DVD format and hand carried to the television station. Ed Sneckenberger recognized the need to improve and integrate technology and volunteered to lead the efforts of the new technology team. The next three years were highlighted by constant and continual improvements in equipment and software to improve communications, information flow, and live and recorded audio and video. These upgrades also greatly increased the functionality of Cowan Hall and the College House. In the summer of 2013, the church was again hit by lightning. This lightning strike damaged the majority of the audio and video equipment throughout the church. 
the insurance settlement, along with significant support from the trustees and the voluntary labor of the tech team, allowed the church to upgrade the audiovisual capabilities to a modern, high-definition production system now located in a basement room and better protected from future lightning strikes. DVDs are now printed on demand. Services are available on the internet, and the Comcast broadcast is transferred electronically to Pittsburgh for Morgantown airing on Wednesday evenings, 7 to 8 p.m. A video security system was also added during these upgrades. The upkeep of the church grounds, including mowing, weeding, mulching, and landscaping, is the responsibility of the facilities and grounds team. Of course, for many years, men in the congregation provided volunteer labor, skills, and tools to repair church property and maintain church grounds. Today, the willing weeders maintain the flower beds. The mission team distributes monies from the noisy offerings to various United Methodist missions, both local and statewide, as well as other charitable organizations in the Morgantown area. They oversee Suncrest support for the Scotts Run Settlement House, Operation Christmas Child, the Salvation Army Angel Tree, and provide more than a hundred Thanksgiving baskets each year, among many other projects. In addition, the team has supported various mission trips for adults and youth, internationally and domestically, including flood and hurricane relief in various states. Mission teams have also provided work teams for numerous repair projects, including in recent years a weekend mission blitz in May, and have made major contributions to Habitat for Humanity through volunteer labor, food, and funds. In 2012, a 16-member high school youth work team embarked on a new, challenging, and memorable international mission trip, traveling to the Dominican Republic where they experienced firsthand the extreme poverty of Haitian refugees living in work camps or vates. These Haitians who labor in the sugar fields suffer from poor living conditions and lack sufficient food. When the youth returned and reported to the church, congregational members supported a Morgantown vate providing food for 1,400 who live under these extraordinary conditions. Thanks to this commitment, subsequently sustained by repeated adult and youth trips to the Dominican Republic, starvation, malnutrition, and infant mortality rates have declined. One important fundraiser for the Dominican Project came as the youth challenged Pastor Lewis to a Hoops for School fundraiser. Lewis, a former WVU basketball player, accepted the challenge. Church members pledged various contributions based on how many free throws Lewis could make in 30 minutes. Though the Sunday afternoon was very hot, he succeeded in raising $14,874, an amount pledged to sending eight Haitian children through school. In 2010, volunteers constructed a picnic pavilion on church property. Jim Clevenger and Pastor Halloran initiated the project, approaching church council, which approved the effort. Once approved, trustees provided $20,000 for materials. 30 volunteers joined Clevenger and began construction in August of 2010. Lytle Construction poured the concrete slab and helped attach the roof. The structure itself measured 60 feet in length, 32 feet in width. The 12-foot ceiling meant that it could provide winter protection for both church, van, and bus. Inside the structure, Clevenger and a handful of workers built 18 tables with three serving tables. In all, the project consumed more than 900 hours of volunteer labor at a cost of $27,000, longer in hours and higher in cost than originally anticipated. Also in 2010, the church constructed a columbarium as part of a long-range plan. Originally, that plan presented in the early 1990s, but lacking congregational support for more than a decade. I think, as everybody knows, our columbarium is a wall. It's a concave curvature wall containing 84 12 by 12 niches, 
Each niche will hold the remains of two people. It's landscaped and lighted. And I believe if needed in the future, we have room in that area for probably 200 more niches. The concrete base was installed by Ron Lytle and his crew, which was really a big contribution. But that concrete base had to be constructed to exact specifications because if you got any settlement or movement at all in that base, then you would have movement in the, uh, in the columbarium itself, and that would really throw everything off. The niche cabinet itself cost us 33000 and it has a brick veneer, and the brick was uh, selected to match the church. And the brick on it was $4,200. And then Justin White did the pavers and the landscaping. That was $3,800. We've installed a veteran's memorial. And that is a bronze plaque uh, on a brick base. The stained glass window that we have installed there, it came from Trinity, and it is the Ascension of Christ. And that was really a good touch to install that window there. It's, it's beautiful. On Confirmation Sunday, 2013, Bishop Sandra Steiner Ball called on the congregation to help reduce barriers to West Virginia's children in poverty. Specifically, she asked church members to provide the Easter offering to children in poverty. With this money, Teens Rock began offering mentoring to at-risk youth in the spring of 2014. This mentoring program connects youth with mentors to give young people a sense of belonging and potential, hoping to nurture a transformation in their lives. Both WVU students and adult church members have served as these mentors. The Respite Rock Adult Daycare Program at Suncrest is a great resource for caregivers providing them much needed time off. The adult daycare program is operated by a registered nurse and church volunteers. In 2014, the West Virginia Annual Conference appointed Pastor Matt Johnson to pilot the Ignite program, a new movement of faith and community. Pastor Johnson is at the helm of the college ministry at Suncrest. This ministry works with young adults on their spiritual journeys and seeks to imitate the life of Jesus while living up, in, and out with the Father. On Sundays after worship services, college students are served a meal generously provided by church volunteers. These meals have been a constant in the life of Suncrest and college students alike for many years. So I'm a senior here at WVU and coming from a small town and growing up in church, when I came here, I actually found it very hard to, to keep my faith in Christ. I started questioning things and, and things were going rough, but one day I was invited here. And every single one of you all have made me feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. You've restored my faith in Christ and this service is just a testament to the effort that you all make to make college students feel at home and feel comfortable worshiping God. So I wanna thank every single one of you for allowing me to come here and welcoming me into your church family. It means the world to me. Also, in the spring of 2014, the church received a state daycare license, and that fall opened the Suncrest Early Learning Center as a year-round program for infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and before and after school programs. The program fills the lower level of the church with the wonderful sounds of children Monday through Friday and has a capacity for 150 children. That same summer, the church received a gift from the Reverend Joe and Sue DeBarty estate in the amount of approximately $170,000. The gift speaks volumes about the vision and commitment of the DeBartys to this church. The trustees used a portion of the funds for a $25,000 state-of-the-art playground for the Early Learning Center. Funds were also used to replace the roof on the church. In 2015, Suncrest celebrated the 50th anniversary of the building of the sanctuary. The celebration included two worship services with several former pastors attending. 
as well as a celebration dinner and a written history of the first 175 years of church life. As we look back with celebration, we are mindful of the journey that members of the church have made through these many years. The historical and spiritual heritage of their journey of faith provides testimony to the power of God's grace and of the loving legacy of our Savior Jesus Christ. Our predecessors have never lost sight of his powerful and amazing message. As a result of their faithfulness and steadfastness, they have built this hallowed chamber in which we worship today and have left a legacy for those who follow. It has been a sacred journey indeed. See 